In this video, we're going to review a few pandas concepts with a real life data set from StockX, a place where basically people buy and sell sneakers. Uh, so you buy a sneaker and then you resell it and then you become a billionaire. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be learning a few topics such as calculations based on groups. We're going to do a little bit of date time manipulation and then some filters. I think moderately advanced is probably overselling it. Um, we'll call it moderately moderate filters. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to be reading in this file right here um, called StockX Data Contest 2019 3. Dot XLS X. Now, because this is an Excel file, we're going to be doing pd.readExcel. Inside of this Excel file, it actually has multiple sheets. If we only want one of those sheets, we have to say, hey, I only want one of those sheets. I want the sheet that's called raw data. And then Excel files always take so long to read in, uh, but that's kind of just how it goes. Because we're dealing with large amounts of money flowing around later on, um, we're going to have some issues. And the issue is going to be that numbers are going to get really, really big and really, really confusing. So when we have numbers that look like this, I don't know what that number is. What I like is for there to be nice little commas in here. And so I'm going to paste in some code that I always put in whenever I'm using pandas. One of them does max columns, which means that if there were too many columns in here for pandas to want to display, it would still display them all. Um, by default, it kind of cuts some of them out and only shows you some of them. The other one is float format. Uh, and what this does here is it says, hey, if you have a number that's really, really big, let's just add commas in it to make it a little bit easier to read. So not actually in the data, it's just when it's displayed to you inside of the data frame. So in this data set, uh, we have these are the release date of the shoes. This is when the shoes were sold. They got brands, they got sneaker names. Here's what the shoe originally sold for. Here's what it sold for at auction. And then here is the shoe size that the person bought and where the person who bought it lives. So what brand has more sales? Well, if I want to know which brand has more sales, every single row is another sale. And so I just want to count the number of times each brand shows up. The way I'm going to do that is value counts. Just goes through, counts the number of times Yeezy shows up, counts the number of times Off-White shows up. If I wanted to have um, per, not parentheses, uh, percentages, I could add normalize equals true in there. But in this case, it doesn't matter. I think I just want raw numbers here. All right. What's the most common shoe size sold? Like you write a sentence, like size blank is the most common shoe size sold, capturing whatever percent of the market. Now, we have shoe size over here, and in the same way we just did, we wanna count how many times each shoe size shows up. Because this has a space in the title of the column, I need to do the square bracket style instead of the uh, period style, but it's fine. I'm not angry. I am angry. Uh, value counts. So 10, size 10, most common shoe size sold. But what percent is that? Again, if we want value counts to return a percentage, we add normalized equals true. So in this case, size 10 is the most common shoe size sold, capturing 11% of the market. Because right there, 0.11, that is 11%. If you want to uh, kind of see this in a way that's a little more human, because I know that when you get to smaller percentages like this, it's kind of hard to remember. Is this, you know, 10%? Is this 0.1%? Is this 1%? Some people will throw in a times 100 here, so you don't have to think. You just know this is 1.3%. This is point, you know, 0.147% no thought involved. What's the median difference between sale price and retail price? So if we want to know the difference between the sale price and the retail price, we just subtract it. So we're going to take the sale price and we're going to subtract 
the retail price, and this is going to be the difference here. Now I'm going to make this a new column called profit. Profit for the person who is selling that shoe. We see it over here. It's a number. It's great. Um, I use square brackets here even though it's only one word, even though there's no spaces, because when you create a new column, you have to use square bracket notation for the column name. Then I'll say, hey, um, what's the median profit? $154. I feel like it should be more, but I guess it's not. All right, next up, what were the sales in dollars to South Dakota, New Mexico, and Vermont? Just going to do a DF head, even though I have the data frame up there, so I can think about it. So the buyer region, I want the buyer region to either be South Dakota or New Mexico or Vermont. So we need to filter. Two ways to do this. First, we're going to do it the long way. Then we're going to do it the short way. If I just wanted buyers in South Dakota, I would say, hey, data frame, give me everything where the buyer region is in South Dakota. If I wanted to add in or New Mexico, I'd have to put parentheses around this, throw in a pipe as an or, and then say, hey, also New Mexico. So this here means or. You cannot type or. It will not work. I'll show you. So this works perfect, right? New Mexico, New Mexico, South Dakota. If I do or, it's going to yell at me. It's going to say the truth value of a series is ambiguous, whatever that means. What that means is just use pipe. It's over on the right-hand side. It's above backslash for me. Or Vermont. So I'm going to say throw another or in there. I'm going to put Vermont in there instead of New Mexico. And there we go. We got this nice, this awful, awful data frame. Uh, and I would like to know the total sales in dollars. So I'm, I'm honestly, I'm going to save this to a new data frame. Um, so region DF, because it's a few different regions, data frame looks like this. Uh, I want to add up all of those sale prices. So I'm going to say, give me the sale price and sum it all up. So much money. Another way I could do this is I could say, Hey, data frame. I'm interested in a few different regions. I'm interested in South Dakota, New Mexico, and or Vermont. And I can say, hey, data frame, I would like you to go look at your buyer region. Find me all of the places where it's in this list of regions. <laughs> a little bit easier, right? Uh, way easier. And so in this case, uh, because this isn't very, very long, I could just throw sale price dot sum on the end of it, um, and I get the same thing. Honestly, doing square brackets after square brackets gives me a little bit of a panic attack because it's a little bit hard to read. It might have been nicer if at the beginning of this we had kind of clear, cleaned up those columns uh, to make them not have spaces in them. But hey, too late now. We're just going to surf with this. So there we go, same thing. Either of those, either of these is fine, but let's be honest, the second one is probably better. What were the total sales in dollars of shoes sized five, six, and seven? Now this is the same thing that we just did, right? Where instead of saying the region is this or this or this, we're now saying the shoe size is this or this or this. So I can just say, hey, I'm going to make a list of sizes, five, six, and seven. Hey, data frame, give me the places where the shoe size is in either of these sizes. Honestly, I could just put five, six, and seven in there, and it does the same thing. It's usually nice to look at your results before you start doing sums and grabbing columns just to make sure it looks like you think it should look like. So in this case, I can see five, six of the sevens, nothing else, so I'm probably doing okay. And then I'll grab the sale price column and add it up with some. There we go. 
What sneaker sold on average for the highest sale price? So what I'm looking to have here is sneaker name. Now, different sneaker names show up again and again and again. It's, let's see, I'll throw in a value counts there so you can see. Um, some of these shoes sold, you know, over 11,000 times because every single row in our data set is a single sale. So what I want to do is I want to say, hey, I want to take these shoes and find all the times they were sold and then get uh, the average sale price. So I'm going to say, hey, data frame, I would like for you to put our data into groups based on the sneaker name. Once you have that, I would like for you to find the sale price. And we're going to get the average. I personally like median better than mean, but that's fine. That's fine. So this is the average sale price based on the sneaker name. Uh, it's not in order over here. So what we need to do is we're going to sort values. On the left hand side is the index. On the right hand side is the values. When I sort values, it's going to put the smallest one at the top because I do not think that $264 is the highest sale price. I'm going to throw ascending equals false over there. And there we go. Air Jordan 1's retro high off white um, number one, followed by that's a decent chunk of uh, the Chicago's. Usually, what I do in this case is I do like a dot head or a dot head three just so I can make sure that I see, yes, these values are in order. I am looking at something that is reasonable. All right, how many shoes in the data set were produced by Nike? DF.head. Okay. A sneaker with either Nike or Jordan in the name is going to be produced by Nike. So I can say, hey, data frame, find me where the sneaker name contains the string Nike or where it contains the string Jordan. Now, when I'm filtering like this, I do not need parentheses around this like I did before. See, we had parentheses around here. The reason we needed parentheses is because this has an equal sign in it. And so, oddly, it gets confused. Pandas gets confused when you start using ors, like what's on the left-hand side, what's on the right-hand side. And it just simplifies things if you're doing comparisons by putting everything in parentheses. For this one, though, we're not making a comparison. This is one chunk from sneaker name to string contains Nike. So it doesn't get confused. I mean, you could put parentheses around it if you want it. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just going to look a little bit crazy. Another thing is we can't use the is in here. So we did buy a region is in this, this, this. We can't say string contains this or this or this. We have to do it separately. We have to say string contains Nike or string contains Jordan. If I want to know how many of the shoes were produced by Nike, I can take this and do a dot shape on the end of it to get a number right there, or you know, I can break some rules and I can do a dot len to see how many rows are in this data frame. Or honestly, I could just look right there and it'll say almost 28,000 rows. Um, either of those is a fine way to do it. What are the top three months? For buying shoes. So what I want to do is I want to say, hey, uh, do people like to shop in around December? Do people like to shop in the summer? Do people like to shop at the beginning of you know, the school year? How's this going to work? So what I want to do is count up all the times each one of these months shows up in order date. So let's look at what our columns are made out of. Um, our order date is, in fact, a date time, so we can use all kinds of date time stuff with it. Wonderfully enough, I can just say, hey, give me the date. So I can say df order date, right? That's our order date right there. If I just want this number here, I can do dot, uh, sorry, no parentheses on that. I can do dt.month. 
and .dt.month will go into that order date and just pull out the month. And then if I want to count the number of times each month appears, there we go, it tells me what month, uh, how many times each month appears. I could also do month name instead. Uh, is month name a function? Yeah. So oddly enough, you can do dt.month, but if you want the month's name, you have to put um, parentheses after it. Just memorize it. So if it's really important to you to be able to put these in order as numbers, you can use uh, the month. If you really want the words, you can do month name. Either one is fine by me. We have to plot that? No, we have to plot it, so we're good. Um, perfect, everything's great. What month had the most total money spent on shoes in this data set? So what we were doing up here is something that I like to call super months, where every single December is combined into this month. Every single November is to, uh, combined into this one. Every single January. So whether it took place in 2017, 2018, 2019, they're all the same. Whereas what I'm doing here is I'm saying, look, I want, you know, uh, what, what is it, September? So I want September 2017 to be different from September 2018. But I want every single one of those dates in September to be the same. So I like to think of this as zooming out. Um, so right now, right now our data is in days, right? 2017, 09, 01. We want to zoom out to make it months. So just 2017, 09, for example. The way we're going to do that is we do that with dot resample. Now, the reason why we are allowed to do this in the first place, the reason why we're allowed to zoom out is because we made order date a date time already. So what I want to do is I want to say, okay, order date. Ah, what I want to do with you is I would like to resample based on months. So A, annual, M, months, D, daily, W, weekly, Q, quarterly. There are a bunch of other ones. 3M is every three months at a time. So I want to say, hey, put this in groups based on the month using the column order date. Now, when I run this, it's just going to give me this delightful date time index resampler object. What I want from this is the most total money spent on shoes. So what I want to do is for every one of these months, for every one of these, you know, month groups here, 2017-09, I would like to add up all of the sale prices in that month. So I'm saying after you've resampled it, after you've zoomed out, grab the sale price and add them all together. By default, it's putting it in date order. So, you know, it'd make a nice chart if I just plot it right now. Let's do it. Great. Look at that price. Amazing. 2018, 2019, 2017 back over there. It's not what I want though, right? What I want to know is what month had the most total money spent. And so in order to get this, these big numbers down here, up here, I'm going to say sort values. It's going to put the smallest at the top. I'm going to say, oh, wait, ascending equals false. That puts the biggest at the top here. And then I want, what, the top three? So, I'll, you know, I'll grab the top five. And then I'll say, here are the top five months in terms of total sales made on the website. Problem being, um, the data is a little bit dirty, so we have really awful sense here, but I looked at it manually, it's fine. It's not gonna kill anybody. So there we go. Uh, we got everything done. We did a decent number of uh, date time calculations and date time manipulations. We talked about a few different ways of filtering, um, whether we're filtering with string contains, whether we're doing ands, whether we're doing ors, whether we're doing uh, is in, all of those. Uh, and then we put things into groups and we also organize them along with, uh, you know, some basic value counts there. So uh, hope you now are perfect.